great to see so many faces. I can see right now that we are slowly climbing from um, upwards of 80 participants on the call right now with uh, people saying hello and signing into the call. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here with us today for this webinar focused on mental health at home and at work during COVID-19. And we feel especially uh, grateful to be joined by Jordan Friesen from the Canadian Mental Health Association of Canada as well. Um, my name is Ali Bentin. I'm the Manager of Programs and Operations at the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, CanWatch. And this morning I've been listening to the birds chirping outside and the sunshine coming down in Victoria, BC. And I've been looking at uh, news articles of animals returning to urban spaces in new ways that hasn't been seen in a while. And I'm reminded of those that have come before me, um, those who have previously cared for the land and continue to care for the land and steward the land. Uh, in particular, I wanted to acknowledge and pay respect to, in BC, in Victoria in particular, the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Indigenous territories of the Wasanich, Sartslip, Sawut, Lekwungen, Wyomouth, and Souk Coast Salish peoples at the top of this call. Um, this call will be in English only, um, but as an introduction to French and Francophone colleagues from across the country, Bonjour tout le monde, c'est un plaisir de vous voir ici aujourd'hui. La présentation sera en anglais aujourd'hui, malheureusement, mais j'aimerais vous dire que les ressources seront traduites en français et seront disponibles après le webinar. When we were thinking about uh, looking back at this webinar and what we wanted to cover off, I was thinking about the amount of change that we have seen over the past few weeks uh, and that we continue we have and continue to manage. And I think that it's clear that this pandemic and the response to the COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented. Uh, this is unprecedented for staff, for managers, for employers, for employees, and that we're all actively managing uh, these changes and these impacts. So across the board, there is no set script for us to follow. Um, there's no set procedures for many of us for the work that we do, and that can lead to uncertainty and challenges in how we navigate this. And even at CanWatch, even though we are a virtual and remote workplace, we're also processing how we can alter our approach and adapt to the context at hand. So no one um, is necessarily immune in the workplace as well to the challenges that we're facing. And I'm reminded of the memes that I've seen floating around on social media, uh, reminding everyone that we are not simply working from home in this context, we are at home sometimes with children, sometimes with parents, pets, and more trying to work. Uh, and I think that that's probably something that Jordan will be, will be speaking to later in his presentation. In addition, just want to acknowledge and put it out there that I know um, for us within this sector, for many caring professions, many of us are keenly and acutely turned into the realities of injustices and inequalities occurring both at home and abroad. Um, we've seen unprecedented responses in terms of repatriating staff to Canada and our teams and our organizations are grappling with how do you fulfill your organizational missions and visions from afar and how can we continue to work in solidarity with our partners, with our friends and with our colleagues overseas and wanting to acknowledge as we start this call that the the ongoing passion and dedication that we see within our sector um, can make it really challenging to leave it at the office especially when your office is now at home as well so we've been listening um, we've been listening to ken watch members to our family and our friends and uh, we've also reviewed the questions that were submitted via the survey online um, and I was really struck by the diversity of experiences that we're facing, by the unique situations that we all find ourselves in, our unique responses and adaptations, um, but also a sense of solidarity too, that uh, we're all going through this together. Um, and I'm very grateful that we are all here together and that we're joined by Jordan, uh, Jordan Friesen from the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, 
And so what the next hour will look like, we're gonna turn it over to Jordan in just a second for him to give us an overview and a presentation of mental health at home and in the workplace. And then the rest of the call will be dedicated to a Q&A period. So as I said before, you'll be able to raise your hands to verbally ask questions. We'll be going through questions that are submitted via Slido, via the chat box, and time pending also the questions that were received via the survey as well. So we'll do our best to get through as many questions and answers as possible. We're joined by Jordan Friesen here today. He is the National Director of Workplace Mental Health with Canadian Mental Health Association and is currently leading CMHA's nationwide efforts to create psychologically healthy and safe work environments. Jordan's experience includes many roles within the mental health field, including direct clinical services, education, organizational and program development, nonprofit leadership and consulting. And he holds a Master of Occupational Therapy degree from the University of Manitoba. And as he said before this call started, this is also his second of four webinars that he's doing today as well. So he's definitely making the rounds and has a lot of um, expertise to lend to today's uh, webinar. So with that, Jordan, a big thanks to you for being here today and I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thanks very much, Ali, uh, and the rest of the CanWatch team. Uh, I was remarking yesterday that uh, this all seemed to come together quite quickly and quite effortlessly, and that's no doubt because of the dedication of the CanWatch team that's, uh, that's, that's working uh, certainly in, uh, in front and behind the scenes uh, to make sure that uh, all of their member organizations have the support they need. So. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, I know that um, the the individuals present are representing organizations that are serving women and children. Um, often, I suspect in um, in challenging situations, um, and particularly more so now uh, with COVID nineteen. And so, uh, one of the reasons I'm very very pleased to be here um, is that I know. Um, this sector and and uh, the whole charitable nonprofit sector across Canada is struggling right now, um, in particular with working in different ways and finding creative solutions to meet the needs of our clients, but also because it's a challenging sector to begin with, um, and this adds another layer of complexity. So uh, I'm, I'm here uh, to offer what I can uh, in terms of support, in terms of guidance, um, and hope that it has, uh, it has, has some value to the group that's here. Um, and also, I think with a, an air of uh, humility and understanding that, um, you know, I certainly don't have this all figured out. The Canadian Mental Health Association certainly doesn't have this all figured out. Um, this is something entirely unprecedented. So uh, my hope is that we can um, address some of the uh, common questions that came up uh, before uh, the webinar and provide some answers and information as well as try to provide some really concrete strategies that uh, you can use and apply within the context of your own life, and most importantly, offer a lot of opportunity for uh, questions and dialogue, which I've been finding is a theme across many of the ways we're engaging with uh, our partner organizations and uh, some of our corporate clients as well, having that space and time to really discuss concerns, ideas, um, and ways in which we're all collectively trying to manage is, is so important right now. As far as the Q&A goes, I will say that, um, as Ali mentioned, I, I have some experience in a lot of different areas of mental health, uh, from crisis services to um, clinical service delivery, um, uh, organizational uh, experience as well. And so uh, I often say, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm willing to offer a sort of ask me anything about mental health. No question is silly. Uh, no question is too uh, too basic. Um, you know, I'm really here to be a source of information for you. So. In terms of what we want to cover today, for context, I want to talk about what psychological challenges look like in crisis situations generally, because it corresponds to a lot of what we're seeing, at least anecdotally right now, and through some objective evidence um, that's been gathered across Canada. I want to talk about some general strategies to support uh, your mental health and well-being uh, during the pandemic. And I'm going to focus in on two areas. One is uh, specific to uh, work and how to uh, stay healthy at work or maintain mental health at work. And then finishing off with uh, some really practical ways that you can be supporting family and friends in the time of uh, physical distancing, which is challenging us uh, to uh, feel and stay close to one another even though we can't be physically close to one another. So um, let's go ahead, uh, if you don't mind, Ali. So the first key message, um, and this came up actually in a number of questions. Um, people were asking, is it 
is it okay that I'm anxious and stressed right now? Like, is that, is that, uh, is that normal? Should I be expecting that? And my first key message is yes, absolutely. It is 100% okay to not be feeling okay right now. Um, emergencies of any kind are inherently stressful. Uh, this goes across the board and, uh, and this is, you know, stress on, I think, a whole new level globally that we haven't experienced before. And we know that stress uh, has a number of interesting um, effects on the body and the mind. And right now we're experiencing stress from a whole bunch of different uh, sources. One, of course, is stress uh, related to fear and anxiety or uncertainty about the illness, COVID-19, and its consequences. Uh, am I going to get it? Am I going to pass it along to other people? Um, you know, in, in other areas of our workforce, uh, and maybe this one as well, how is this going to impact my job, my livelihood? So there's real tangible fear, uncertainty, and, and associated anxiety because of that, and, and it's uh, very natural to feel that way. There's also uh, an element of forced adaptation where you're being asked to drastically and immediately alter our routines, our habits, the ways we do everything from grocery shopping to working, to uh, educating our children. Uh, that's all being uh, forced upon us in a pretty rapid change. And then finally, and I think really importantly, uh, we're seeing a lot of strain on our social networks. And uh, I end up talking uh, a lot about uh, resilience because it's a, a topic that in particular workplaces are quite interested in. And um, many come to the table with the perception that resilience is an individual trait and that it's something that uh, you know individually we need to be working to improve. It's like this muscle that that we need to we need to work on and train ourselves. And in some ways it is. But what most people don't realize about resilience is that at the core of what resilience is um, it, is it, it depends on our network of support and connection. Um, and that's one of the fundamental theories around how human beings are resilient. Is we're not resilient on our own. We're actually resilient in community. Um, and so part of the reason why this is so challenging is because our social networks have been disrupted and that core part of our resilience I think has has uh, in some ways been taken away and we're really struggling to try to pull it back. Um, so all of that to say it's really stressful right now um, and it, it's okay not to be okay and with that stress we know chronic or acute comes an increased incidence of, of mental health problems and primarily anxiety disorders. Um, so uh, we are are certainly seeing anecdotally uh, more discussion about anxiety right now. Uh, we expect that that will continue long into the future past the time when we all go back to quote unquote normal life. Um, we're also seeing exacerbation of existing mental health problems. And uh, so again, if you're someone that uh, is, uh, experiences a mental health condition on a daily basis, I think it is, uh, it is uh, to be expected that you know this period of time is is going to make it slightly more challenging for you to manage your mental health and it requires some extra care and diligence. So that's a little bit of the context. So one thing we've been talking more and more about as well again for context is this idea of a, a response phase and a recovery phase to the pandemic. And right now we're in the response phase. The, there's an active pandemic ongoing. We're trying to find solutions uh, to keep people healthy, to keep people safe, to keep our economy moving and many other things. Um, and, and so there are, of course, specific actions that you know, our organizations are taking, like physical distancing, that our governments are taking um, to help um, mitigate the immediate impact. But uh, there's also a recovery phase that's going to occur after the pandemic slows down. Um, and that's going to be actually, uh, I think, longer than many people are anticipating. What we generally talk about or what we've been talking about is you know, a, a recovery period anywhere from six to really 36 plus months um, in terms of mental health. And, and you know, and we can, we can uh, tie that into economic recovery, tie that to healthcare system recovery, many things. But um, I think the, the, the point to get across here is that while um, this next short term period is going to be challenging, we are gonna to continue to be challenged, um, likely years past this pandemic, and we're gonna see the mental health implications of this pandemic, um, likely during that recovery phase most prominently. So um, in our messaging, both to organizations, as well as to government and to individuals, is to not just expect that once the pandemic subsides, um, we're going to be returning back to baseline as far as our mental health goes either. So I think that's an important consideration for all of us in that um, even once this pandemic uh, comes to a resolution, 
uh, not to expect that we'll suddenly be feeling happy and chipper again, um, because that's not necessarily an expectation. And what you see in front of you is an illustration of what uh, you know a disaster and emergency response typically looks like. And you see that you know that response phase um, on the left hand side where you see this spike up in terms of cohesion um, and uh, and resilience at a population level. And then you do see it tend to dip, right? Where people realize, oh, this, this is actually really gonna significantly impact my life. And, and it does take a long time generally to recover. So we talk about flattening the curve from a, from a, a COVID-19 perspective, but we're also starting to talk about flattening the curve from a mental health uh, and illness perspective as well. Understanding that the more we can do now to put appropriate mental health supports in place, both at a population level, but also for you individually, um, the better we're going to be off in the long run during that recovery period when many residual mental health issues uh, continue to surface at the population level. You know, it, it would be naive of me to say that there's a single silver bullet to supporting and managing your mental health during COVID-19. What I've got here is uh, a couple of concrete strategies that, you know, based on expert opinion, um, based on solid research, uh, are helpful. But ultimately, we're all learning as we go, as I've said. Um, and, and there's an element of finding what works for you in here. So I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Um, and then certainly there'll be questions about them as we go and, and more than happy to get to those. So I think the first one, and we've already talked about that, is acceptance. You know, accepting that this is a situation that is largely out of control, accepting that you're going to feel a degree of stress, that you're going to feel a degree of anxiety and worry, and accepting that um, that's that's unlikely to change in the short term um, and finding some way to be at peace with that. Um, and that's a challenging thing to do. Uh, there's lots of, lots of research around uh, acceptance as a practice through mindfulness, for example, through different um, psychological therapies. But I think the key here is, is to um, accept that some things are going to be outside of your control, accept that it's going to feel uncomfortable, uh, but also accept that that's, that that's okay, that's not abnormal, uh, and certainly you're not alone in feeling that way. Um, the second strategy that I suggest, you know, in this and many other circumstances is about challenging your negative thoughts. So I'll get to this in a little bit more detail in a second, but um, all of us, when we uh, experience things or when we hear things, when we watch the news, when, when uh, we interact with people, we're prone to certain negative types of thinking that automatically, um, color the way we think and feel and act. And so there's some ways in which you can think about reframing situations uh, in your brain that are actually gonna help you feel better and help you uh, actually do things differently in terms of managing your health. So let's put, let's put a pin in that one. I'm gonna come back to that in more detail. The other one that's really practical after that is limiting the intake of, of stressful information. So uh, my, my suggestion and recommendation across the board is to try to limit the intake of uh, news and media that you subject yourself to. Um, in particular, um, news. And I know that COVID-19 is on a 24-7 news cycle right now. And what you're actually doing, because we know that this pandemic is a, is a stressor, you're actually continuously exposing yourself to a stressful stimuli. And that's going to activate different parts of your brain that uh, generate that fight or flight response. It's gonna, over time, make it difficult to focus and difficult to concentrate, uh, difficult to feel motivated, um, and, uh, and really increase those bad stress hormones in your brain. So although there's a desire to be informed, I would be strategic about how you get your information, when you get your information, and, and actually try to limit the amount of information you take in and when you take it in. Um, because otherwise it's going to result in a lot of you know, what I've been calling psychological noise within your brain. It's going to make it really difficult to function. So limit the amount of information. Um, you've heard people talking about staying connected, uh, you know, and I, I can't say that enough. Um, I, I recognize that you know, phone and Zoom and, and Skype and text and, and, and chat are, are not the same. Um, I realize that, but uh, it's at least a proxy for, for human connection at this point. Um, again, going back to that conversation about resilience, it's really your support networks that make you resilient. So even though it may be tempting to disconnect um, and, and may feel in some ways therapeutic right now, try to avoid that tendency and really push yourself to try to be and stay connected to meaningful relationships in your life. This is a good time to drown out those relationships that you don't really want or never wanted in the first place. Um, 
but certainly stay connected to the people that are meaningful to you. Uh, proactive health management behaviors. This goes back to things like uh, physical activity, getting enough rest, um, eating a diet that's nutritious. Um, those are all core health management behaviors that are really more important now than ever. Um, a lot of your psychological well-being is determined by your physical well-being. So, you know, the more you can look after your physical health, um, the more it's going to benefit your mental health. In particular, sleep. Um, I find that sleep is a challenging one these days. Um, so uh, try to maintain good sleep hygiene. I know if you're working at home, uh, it can be, of course, very easy to try to you know, work in your bed or um, you know, uh, watch Netflix, uh, net, watch Netflix before you go to bed, things like that. But as much as you can, you know, bed is for sleeping um, and other things that I won't mention on a webinar. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, try to maintain a, a separation between your relaxing space and your working space. Um, it's really helpful from a sleep hygiene perspective. Second last one here is around focusing on what you can control. Um, there's a lot you can't control. Uh, so you can't rather, there's a lot you can't control. Um, your locus of control these days is a psychological term and you know, it refers to what you have sort of psychological ownership and control over. Um, and it is much smaller these days. Um, you don't have control over, um, you know, for instance, um, uh, sorry, you don't have control over um, necessarily, um, you know, how other people are responding to the crisis. You don't have control over, um, you know, what the healthcare system is doing. You don't have control over what Donald Trump is saying in the United States. But you know, the things you do have control over are your immediate environment, right? Um, the relationships you have with your family, the routines you establish throughout your day, um, how you organize your physical space. Um, so focus on those things. Um, those are things you can control and, and it's going to give you a sense of self-efficacy and it's going to help actually reduce your anxiety if, if you feel like uh, or if your focus is on things that you can actively control and manipulate within your own environment. Um, it's going to, again, help you feel grounded and safe. Uh, and then finally, a point about good coping versus bad coping. Um, some people have been asking me are there good ways to cope or bad ways to cope and and my stance is that um, you know, coping is in many ways individual and from my perspective uh, uh, you know, should be uh, non-judgmental, right? I'm, I'm not gonna judge the way any of us is coping with this pandemic, but what I will say is that there are uh, a healthy, healthier and less healthy ways to cope. Um, so uh, a great example would be um, substance use, alcohol or other legal or, or illegal substances. Um, you know, I think there's been uh, some data showing that uh, liquor sales in the month of March are, are, are up anywhere from, uh, you know, 150 to 200% across Canada. Um, so, you know, it's an example of, is, is, that, is that a bad way to cope? Well, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge, um, I'm not going to judge uh, the way any of us is coping, but I will say that it's, it's not the healthiest way to cope. So I think identifying the, the ways that you might be coping and really asking yourself, is this something that's, is, is this something that's truly helping me? Uh, or is this something that's, um, that's simply putting a bandaid over the way I'm feeling? And, and choosing to cope using things that are actually truly helpful versus uh, band-aid solutions is gonna be better for you in the long run, can be healthier for you. So this is uh, the piece around challenging negative thoughts. So um, this pulls from a, 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 a a therapy practice called cognitive behavioral therapy. Some of you might be familiar with it, but it's essentially this idea that the way we think influences the way we feel, which influences uh, the way we act, which influences the things that happen to us. And so what we see are times we're caught in this negative thought spiral. So if something happens, we automatically think something bad about it. It creates a really negative emotional state in us. And then we do something that's really unhelpful to the situation response, which kind of makes the situation worse. So uh, a great example um, would be, uh, you know, for instance, you get, a, you get a text from your spouse or significant other um, saying something about, I don't know, uh, did, you, did you take out the garbage last night, right? Uh, actually, I got this one this morning. Um, did you take out the garbage last night? And, uh, and my first automatic thought was, uh, well, no, I didn't. I thought you were going to do that. Why are you getting mad at me? Right? So my automatic negative thought was, oh, she's mad at me. She's blaming me for this. Um, my emotion was, well, anger, frustration, you name it, right? And my unhelpful action was to send a text message back that was maybe a little more heated than I should have. 
you know, as a result, now she's upset, right? And she communicates back to me. And of course, I start thinking in the same fashion. And it's this negative spiral that I get caught in as a result. And that's one example, right? But you can think of many others. Um, so trying to break that negative thought spiral is really key. And it, and it often starts with that first negative thought uh, and learning to reframe or rebalance the way our brain is thinking. And it takes practice, but some common thought traps that we get caught in are catastrophizing. So this one is, is essentially thinking uh, in worst case scenarios. Um, so for example, um, you, know, you hear that uh, a shipment of N95 masks is being delayed. And your initial thought is, um, oh my goodness, if I go to the hospital, I'm gonna get sick and die. Now, um, could that happen? Sure, absolutely. Um, but let's think about that in terms of whether or not that thought is balanced. Um, is, that, is, that, um, is that actually the likely outcome or is that the worst case scenario? Um, and if you can reframe your thinking, catch yourself in some of these thought traps, it'll change your emotional state. It'll also change the way you act and behave as a result. Other thought traps are black and white thinking. Um, so it's uh, sort of an always or never type thinking. Um, you know, uh, I always take out the garbage, you never do, right? Um, and then emotional reasoning. Um, I feel, therefore, it's true, right? Um, I feel, um, I feel, oh, I don't know, pick a word. I, I feel, um, I feel uh, like you don't like me, therefore, you don't like me, right? Um, so some of these thought traps, and, and we can apply them to some of the things we hear in the news, um, some of the things we think about in terms of worst case scenarios around COVID-19, it's really helpful to challenge these thoughts. Ask yourself, is, is there evidence to, be, to support thinking this way? Is this based on a, a, a rational thought process or is this more emotional um, in terms of the way I'm thinking? That can be a helpful reframe. Uh, and the next one comes back to um, self-care. So we talked about um, uh, uh, healthy versus less healthy coping or good or bad coping. A lot of it's tied up in this idea of self-care that you should be taking care of yourself right now. Um, and so there's, a, you know, there's many little uh, self-care uh, comments that I, I'd like to talk about. But um, you know, my key message here is that self-care, if done well, is actually really hard work. Um, self-care in its true sense is not bubble baths and chocolate. Um, uh, self-care is actually about facing stressors rather than avoiding them and developing intentional habits and practices that support your well-being and manage stress versus some of those band-aid solutions that I talked about earlier. So um, when we talk about self-care and you're probably gonna hear a lot about self-care, remember that um, self-care is, uh, is more than spending a week's salary on dubious Etsy products as, as articulated here. Um, it's more than just sitting silently and pretending you don't have a brain. It's more than sitting on the couch and watching Netflix, right? Self-care is active practice. Um, so remember that when you hear self-care, uh, and you'll hear again a lot of it in the next uh, coming weeks and months. But self-care is something that's hard work. It's about developing intentional practices around wellness. And that's why I encourage you all of, all of you to consider um, in terms of your own self-care uh, over the next number of weeks and months. So from a workplace perspective, a um, couple key messages. First one being this is not business as usual. Ali mentioned this. We aren't working from home during a pandemic. We are staying safe at home and trying to get some work done. And so um, thinking about your work and if you're someone that manages people, thinking about your team's work in that light is a really helpful reframe. Um, we expect that productivity is going to dip across the board because our energy is taken up focusing on a whole, sorts of, a whole, sort, whole assortment of other things. Um, and from a workplace perspective, the key, message, key messages here are certainly empathy and understanding is critical. You have staff that are balancing more things, that you, more things than you likely know. Um, so actually understanding what those are uh, can be a helpful first step in, in developing that empathy muscle in yourself. And then finally, uh, being clear about what is the absolute must get done work. Um, because you can expect your, your staff across the board are going to have less capacity. If you're an employee, you're, you're feeling this right now, that you just have less capacity to get stuff done, even though you have the same eight hours in a day. Um, so being clear as an organization about what your priorities are and what are the things that are nice to haves, but but not critical to keeping the work going, I think is really important right now um, from a, a work perspective. So a couple strategies on both sides um, uh, and uh, AMREF, uh, someone from AMREF uh, has just suggested a CBT uh, book, which is great. Um, so thank you for that in the chat. Uh, on the employee side, 
a couple of practical strategies within work. One, acceptance, right? Uh, sort of been a, a key theme throughout. This is not business as usual. Uh, the same expectations you would normally put on yourself uh, don't apply because you have a lot more um, that a lot more going on right now in life than you would otherwise. Uh, establish new routines to fit your life. So uh, this is going to be helpful in terms of that locus of control. Um, find routines that fit your new life, right? Um, so a nine to five may not anymore, especially if you have kids, um, but it is important to have routine and just accept that those routines aren't necessarily going to be the routines you're used to uh, and embrace new routines that fit the balance of responsibilities that you have. Uh, connect with colleagues certainly is sort of a connection theme across the board. And then finally access any supports that you may have within your workplace, whether it's um, counseling or therapy services, EAP program, um, any of those types of supports, um, access them now uh, when, you're, when you're maybe feeling slightly stressed as opposed to when you're feeling acutely anxious um, because they're best used at, at, at the early stages if you're starting to feel unwell. For managers or leaders, uh, over communicate. Um, we cannot communicate enough right now. Fear, worry, anxiety grow in the absence of information. So make sure you have uh, consistent and transparent communications with your employees. Tell them what you know, uh, what you're not sure about, but trying to figure out, uh, and then uh, and what you're trying to do to get more information. Uh, those are, I think, three really concrete takeaways. Um, we talk about uh, psychological safety, and so I'm going to emphasize that here as well. It's something that creates trust and high performance in teams when times are challenging. So a couple keys here, seek clarity over compliance. Um, so rather than reinforcing or enforcing rigid rules, understand uh, an employee's perspective and maybe uh, why they are, uh, why they're unable to meet your expectations uh, and approach them with that need for clarity first. Role model healthy behaviors, much like what I talked about in particular balance um, and uh, reflecting and being clear how, uh, how your work life has changed. Uh, as a result of, of, say, working from home or changing the way you work. And again, providing clear direction and priorities. What are the absolute must get done right now? Um, what are the things that are nice to have uh, if we as a team have, have collective energy to do that? In terms of supporting others, uh, you know, people ask, well, how can I support someone who I expect might be challenged with a mental health issue right now? And I've tried to condense this down to sort of four key points here. Um, the first is, is to ask them how they're doing and express your concern. And you don't have to be face-to-face -to, -face to do that. Um, you can be over the phone, you can be over Zoom, you can be over Skype. Um, ask and express your concern. Tell them what you've noticed or what your concerns are in as objective a way as possible um, and express that you care about them. Uh, a caring relationship for many people who are experiencing a mental health challenge is really the first step towards their recovery uh, over the short and long term. Uh, second is listen and understand. Um, don't necessarily jump in to provide solutions. Uh, really listen to them and understand what their experience is and reflect that understanding. I know if we're working in, uh, in, in the, the social services or, or nonprofit sector, we probably have pretty good listening skills. Um, this is your chance to apply that in your personal life as well. So make sure to listen, look to, listen actively, demonstrate your understanding of what someone's experiencing. Uh, encourage help. Um, so, you know, if you're a colleague, refer them to resources available in the workplace. Um, many provinces are rolling out virtual therapy options, um, uh, long and short term. So encourage them to seek information, encourage them to connect with a primary care provider if they're really struggling to function. Uh, and then finally, connect back and provide practical support. So um, uh, don't, uh, don't forget about them. Uh, and then when you're connecting back, you know, focus on what you can do very concretely to support them. Um, you know, can I send you a grocery gift card? Can I make you a casserole and drop it off on your front step? Um, those really practical supports are, are so helpful. Um, and the goal here is not for you to be anyone's only support, uh, but, 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 but one of many, right? So again, it's the same concept. We're more resilient when we have a wide array of resources to support us. So encourage them to connect to, to more than, than just you if they're really struggling. Um, I put it down on the slide here as well. This is the Crisis Services Canada um, toll-free number 24-7 in English and French for really acute uh, mental health crises. So this is something that uh, certainly you, uh, you can call if you have concerns about someone. You can call with them. You can encourage them to call uh, if someone's really in immediate need of, of support and help. Um, so that's there for you as well. And that's 24-7 in English and French anywhere in Canada. So then a couple of final tips, I think, for, for children and youth. 
Um, if you have kids at home and you're trying to work and parent at the same time, this is obviously challenging. Um, so first tip would be, of course, to keep them active and engaged. Things that stimulate their creativity and problem solving are really helpful. Um, uh, especially physical activity uh, can help them in terms of their own mental health needs. Uh, same thing as you would do for yourself at work, but for, the, for children and youth, establish and maintain routines. They're going to, again, going to be different from uh, if and when they were in school, um, but routine is still really important. Help them connect with their peers the same way uh, you might be doing. Um, you know, we often view devices and social media as things that sort of pull uh, children and youth into isolation. But I would say this is an opportunity to actually encourage them to use that device that they're attached at the hip to um, for actually connecting to their peers. Um, and so, you know, social media, as an example, may actually be a really helpful outlet from, for them right now, uh, with the understanding, of course, that it's being used appropriately and safely. Um, engage as a family unit. I think this is where it becomes um, really tough. Um, is when you're with them all the time, uh, when you're in the same physical space all the time. I think there's a difference between being in the same physical space as your family and actually engaging with your family. So even if it's, a, even if it's something as simple as a 20 minute card game, um, try to find an activity that you can engage with as a family unit to reinforce that connection um, that you have um, outside of just being in the same physical space all the time. And then finally, uh, please, please, please be kind to yourself. Um, there is nobody that has this figured out. It's the reality of uh, work and kids and family, you know, not, maybe in the same environment. So be kind to yourself. It's not going to be perfect. Um, and we're all trying to figure it out uh, in the same way. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. That is absolutely wonderful. And um, so great to hear and be reassured and know that to be not okay, to be uncomfortable right now is normal and to be expected. And I think that can provide... Um, a sense of comfort there. Um, I think also looking at resiliency is mm -hmm. uh, really interesting and the idea of um, flattening the curve on mental health too, at the same time as the physical is making sure that we keep in mind the mental health aspects Absolutely. as well. Um, I have been uh, informed that the link, looking through the comments to Slido, has not worked. Um, we're going to flip back to the QR code here for those who don't know how to use QR codes. Um, take a second to, to look here. This is one of the ongoing changes that are happening is Zoom is also changing on uh, what seems to be a weekly basis right now. So sorry that that link did not work. If you know how to use the QR code, feel free to pull that up now or to share um, any questions that you have in the chat box. And another change from Zoom over the past week is getting rid of the raised hand function. So if you click on reactions down in the bottom middle of your pane, there's um, a clap or a thumbs up. So if you click on either of those, we will know that you have a question that you would like to uh, come off mute for to speak. And we would love to hear from you at this time. Um, while we wait for anyone who does want to give a thumbs up or a clap to come off of me and ask a question, uh, we have received some questions thus far, and so we can start walking through those, and then if anyone will keep an eye out for any thumbs up from anybody. Um, so one of the first questions that we have received is, uh, which you've touched on a little bit, is how can one best provide support to someone who has mental health issues, chronic depression or anxiety, who is remote right now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, um, from the perspective of being a colleague, uh, which I'm assuming is sort of the lens here, um, you know, the, I guess the, the analogy I often talk to employers about when they're working in remote teams is, is, is the idea of a uh, sort of water cooler talk. And uh, I've worked in a remote team for the past three years. It's something I've noticed is that our opportunity for that sort of casual conversation, that casual check-in to understand how people are doing emotionally um, often doesn't happen because the reasons that we connect when we're in a remote team are for uh, meetings on the hour or on the half hour. Um, and so as a colleague, um, I would encourage you to be proactive in terms of reaching out to anybody who you think uh, is struggling or experiencing a mental health issue, number one, uh, with no agenda, um, simply to check in with them and understand how they're doing. You know, you'd be surprised how much time we actually spend in those sorts of behaviors on a daily basis when we're working in a physical space. But uh, 
that type of interaction for some reason seems artificial when we're working remotely. So step number one is to make an active effort to reach out to them literally just for the purposes of checking in um, and hearing about how they're doing. And, and then some of the same sort of principles apply otherwise. Um, certainly um, express your concern, listen to them and understand what they're experiencing without necessarily jumping straight to advice or solutions. And then very similarly, make sure to direct them to appropriate supports. Now, this, act, this though is a bit of a responsibility on you is to, to figure out what supports are available. Um, and that may be through your workplace uh, or that may be through your local healthcare system. But I think it's important for everybody um, you know, we talk about this at, across the population, but um, everybody should have some idea of where to go to get help in your community. Um, and so if you don't know, um, I, would, I would do some digging, call public health, call your local CMHA, understand what services they provide. We have uh, 87 CMHAs in 330 communities across Canada. Uh, if you go to our website, cmha.ca, you can find your local CMHA and get a sense of what's available in your community. That's really the first step. And then, again, encourage them to seek help um, and then follow up, uh, understand how they're, how they're doing on a regular basis so that you can keep encouraging them to seek that help. Great, that's wonderful. Another question that's come in is um, looking for support on how to navigate the persistent fear of unemployment, being laid off, economic mm -hmm. recession. Uh, both for ourselves as individuals and as supervisors of teams. Yeah, and and this is this is tough. Um, I'll be quite honest with you. This is one of those things where um, I think the expectation that that you're not going to feel a degree of anxiety, worry, or uncertainty around this issue uh, is um, is uh, <laughs> sorry. It's been a long day already. Uh, the expectation that you don't feel an anxiety about this issue is, is uh, I think, a false one. Um, it's, it's, again, natural to feel some anxiety here. From, you know, from yourself, again, it's, it's focus on what, what can I control right now? And, and you, you probably can't control uh, to some degree whether or not you're going to get laid off. You can't predict it. Um, so spending time and energy trying is, in some ways, a futile exercise. Um, Starting to think about what your plans might be if that happens can be a helpful exercise, right? So we talk about what is, what is and is not helpful coping, right? I would say in this case, helpful coping could be making a contingency plan um, for that worst case scenario and, and understanding what that plan is. And you'll find once you have that plan put down uh, somewhere, either on paper or at least in your brain, um, you can put to rest some of those fears and anxieties to say, okay, even if this happens, I don't need to think about it. I know what my plan is going to be. I know what resources I need to access. Um, and then hopefully it'll allow you to put some of it out of your mind. In terms of employees, I think, again, communicating and being clear about here's what I know, um, here's what I think I know, and I'm trying to find out more, um, and here's what I absolutely do not know uh, and don't expect to get an answer to. Um, and communicating those on a consistent basis uh, is really the, the best thing you can do right now. Um, employees don't tend to get fatigued from frequent communication. They get fatigued from information overload. Um, so make your communication uh, succinct, consistent, um, and tailored to exactly what employees uh, need to know, uh, what, what's the news they need to know. Wonderful. And another question that's come in is, how can we talk about this type of anxiety caused by the pandemic in a way that doesn't unintentionally erase or silence people with diagnosed anxiety disorders? Mm. Great question. Um, thank you for that. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, this is where language uh, I think makes a big difference. Um, there's a difference between feeling, uh, feeling anxious uh, and experiencing an anxiety disorder. Um, so, you know, it's the same way uh, somebody might say, I'm, I'm depressed today, right? Um, and, and, and so perhaps it's, it's about adjusting that language. And so I'll often say things like, instead of, uh, you know, anxiety, I'll say anxious feelings or anxious thoughts, um, unease, worry, um, because those aren't necessarily disorders. And then reserving, you know, um, the term uh, you know, anxiety or anxiety disorder really to describe the experience of someone who has a diagnosed condition. In the same way, I would, I would um, defer, uh, you know, the use of the word depression, um, not, not for uh, 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 someone that has a, a down day, but for someone that's, that's really experiencing that as a medical condition. And, 
And so um, that would be my advice is just to be mindful of your language in that way. Um, now, and I apologize uh, if, uh, if I've not been as careful as I should have been today. It's something that all of us, uh, myself included, uh, continue to, to, to try to work on in terms of the language we use. But that's, that's I think, my, my biggest piece of advice is just to be mindful of, of the language you use to describe the way you're feeling. Things like worry and uncertainty and fear are often what, are often what we mean when we say I'm feeling anxious. Wonderful. Um, another more technical question that has come in is in relation to slide 10, uh, which Tina, if you could switch over to slide 10. Mm -hmm. um, what is the vertical axis on that slide? Ah, gotcha. So I, I guess the vertical axis, um, you know, you could think about it in many different ways here. You could think about it in terms of um, sort of, you could think about it in terms of hope and optimism. Um, which is which is the way I would think about this uh, right now, um, sort of hope, optimism, um, and and uh, I think um, general state of well-being is probably the best way to describe it. This particular figure doesn't make specific reference to it. It's it's more of an abstract illustration to help describe the ups and downs of pandemic, but you can think about it along many different um, many different uh, uh, domains or axes or dimensions. Um, this could be, you know, in terms of this could be your mental health, this could be um, your sense of community or your sense of community cohesion. This could also represent to some degree an economic picture as well. Um, I think the best way to think about it is, um, you know, sense of, of meaning, purpose, hope, optimism, um, some of those positive qualities um, that, that we're, we're striving to recover after an epidemic or a pandemic rather. Great. And for those who have done uh, cross cross cultural competency training, it looks a lot like the uh, the culture shock curves <laughs> seen as well. Yeah. Um, looking at another question that's come in is, what are some signs that we should be looking for? Um, assuming that this is for managers, but also mm -hmm. just for people in general, of signs that people may need some uh, professional mental health support. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I. As a as an individual, you know the advice I give people is you know not not knowing any more than I know about you in terms of your name. Uh, in some cases, right? I would say, if you feel that uh, if you feel that uh, challenges with your mental health, and I would talk about it in terms of stress or unease or worry. In this case, uh, if you feel that those things are adversely impacting your ability to function on a daily basis. That right there is enough of a sign that you should speak to a healthcare professional um, and reach out for help. Um, so it really comes down to function. That's a common criteria, you know, across all, all diagnostic categories is impaired functioning. And uh, with, with the understanding that our, all of our functioning is, is slightly impaired these days. Um, but if, if feelings of stress, uncertainty, fear, and worry are impacting you so much that it's affecting uh, your ability at a fundamental, fundamental level to take care of yourself, to take care of your family, um, or to uh, or to show up uh, at work. Uh, those are signs that that it's maybe affecting you um, adversely, and that you should seek help. And and not to say that um, not to say that that's abnormal, right? Again, what we're going to be seeing is that many of us are going to be experiencing those things, um, and that's to be anticipated in the context of a pandemic. From an employer or from a manager perspective. You know, the things that apply across the board, you know, you know your employees best. Um, so you understand to some degree their, their baseline. And it's those departures from baseline that, that really might be indications. So I talk about functional signs of poor mental health with employers. So uh, drastic changes in their quality of work, their quantity of work, um, their perceived mood, introversion or extroversion. Uh, are all signs that, you know, first and foremost, you should reach out and ask respectfully and inquire, um, but also signs that it, this may be a helpful time to point them towards uh, more, uh, more dedicated support uh, to help them with their mental health. Great. And in follow up to that, I think we have time for about two more questions here. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple questions that have come in around what if I work for an organization that isn't being supportive of staff challenges during this time? What are some ways to encourage uh, a more compassionate or empathetic response, um, mm -hmm. particularly related to productivity yeah. um, and expectations to function with the yeah. individual? Um, well, I mean, I suppose you could get them to call me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
Um, but uh, uh, I, I've only got so many hours in the day, uh, so that's a dangerous uh, thing to put out there. But um, I think that the way that I've seen helpful in terms of framing this up for organizations is uh, to understand that um, that employees are going to be most productive when they're healthiest. Uh, and, and by and large, employees at work want to work and they want to do good work. So um, I think focusing on the health and well-being of employees as a key determinant of their productivity is a really helpful lens to have uh, or to start that conversation with. Um, and we know from a lot of research that mentally healthy workplaces have um, increased productivity uh, they're more creative, more innovative. Uh, they have better bottom lines for that matter. Um, so there's a lot of um, really hard business evidence to say that the mental health of your employees matters at a business level. So that might be another helpful, um, helpful way to frame the conversation. Um, and other than that, uh, you know, I think uh, continuing to be an advocate for your own needs um, is, is, what, is what you can do. What you should do if you're involved with a union, certainly leveraging um, the union to help advocate for what your needs are right now uh, could be a strategy that might be helpful for you as well. Wonderful. And just looking at time, I know that there are questions that have come in that we have not managed to get to. And I want to thank everyone for sending in your questions. And I know that there is a lot of um, need for these types of conversations. So feel free to reach out. There is contact information for Jordan here as well as for myself. Um, and speaking of co-workers, I have my, um, my co-worker, my cat in the background who's uh, wrestling around, so apologies if there's sound in the background. Another set of questions that have come in, and we can speak to this really briefly, is um, what about resources? What about, mm -hmm. um, in particular, French services and French resources? Um, and I think to, to tell everyone that uh, we are working with uh, Jordan and we are collating resources as well and we'll be sharing those out um, as much as possible. We will be collating French uh, resources as well and sharing those after this call alongside a recording of this webinar too. Um, so we'll do our best to share what we know um, and I'd encourage everyone else to continue to reach out and share resources that you are aware of as well. I know that I've seen um, online that there are some free services that are coming out too. Um, for example, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart has a new managing stress during COVID-19 uh, program that they've launched. There's a University of Toronto one as well, as well as a wealth of other resources out there. So I know um, there's questions around quality and making sure that they are uh, quality services that are being accessed. Um, but there are resources that are available. So we'll be sharing those shortly afterwards. Jordan, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. I know that um, doing multiple webinars in one day is a feat unto itself, um, but big kudos to you for coming and speaking with us and a big thank you for all of your your time spent uh, preparing for this call and making sure that the um, information shared is actually really applicable to us and to our sector. I want to share, every, uh, share a big thank you with everyone who is on the call as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your questions and your comments for filling out this survey as well beforehand. Um, that helped inform Jordan's presentation too. In terms of upcoming webinars, what we are looking at is next week, we will have a webinar focused on Ken Watch's public engagement working group, who will be discussing how our sector can strengthen and align our collective engagement with Canadians in global health and international development during COVID-19. Uh, and next week, the uh, webinar will be simultaneously translated as well. So for those who are Francophone on today, uh, please know that Ken Watch is uh, looking for ways to further connect and link into Francophone uh, audiences as well. So registration details will be included in the follow-up email that all of you can expect tomorrow, um, including the resources as well as a recording of this presentation. Um, but again, Jordan, thank you so much. To everyone who's still on the call, thank you for being here today. And I hope all of you take care um, and please reach out with any questions that you have. Thanks for having me. Great. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan.